Well, good morning and welcome to Cross Community Church on this uh, Independence Day weekend. I'm grateful that you are here today. Uh, I had the profound joy of celebrating baptism. We'll be doing that again in the second service, another baptism. And so we're just thankful for what God is doing in our midst. Our mission team just got back from West Virginia. I think 48 uh, went. They're, uh, if they're the ones that they fall asleep today, just give them grace because they, they've been uh, sleeping uh, in, on air beds and taking cold showers for a week. So just really thankful for what God was doing both in Uh, our students and the leaders, and then ultimately through them in the city. They were working there in there in West Virginia. God is good. He uses people just like us, people who are uh, weak and and flawed in some ways and incapable in ourselves of representing Christ or taking the gospel to anybody. He uses people like us to take his gospel to the world. Now today, uh, we're going to be continuing uh, uh, really a sermon I started two weeks ago, and I talked about the church that changed the world. We we worked our way through the New Testament book of Acts, and we saw how ordinary men and women, people just like you and I, uh, what, what God didn't do when he decided to build his church was gather the greatest minds from around the globe and the, the most talented and skilled people. Uh, but what God did was take ordinary men and women just like us, and he gave them his Holy Spirit, and he commissioned them to go and to make disciples. He told them, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. And they believed him, and God did his work Through them. Uh, Those ordinary men and women who were at first in Jerusalem and then scattered by persecution, uh, they did. They took the gospel to the ends of the earth. We sit here today. We're worshiping Jesus Christ. We've heard the gospel. We look back to men and women who didn't keep it within themselves. They didn't huddle there in Jerusalem, but they took the gospel with them everywhere that they went. And so what we're doing here today, we're talking about a church that changed the world. And our our text for this is Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. I want to read that to you, and then we'll we'll jump in. It it says this, um, these early believers, here's what they did that set them up for success. Wherever they went, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so, again, an ordinary group of people who devoted themselves to what seemed like fairly ordinary activities. If you've grown up in church, you're like the apostles' teaching. That's the word, right? They devoted themselves to the word. And if you're a good Baptist, you know about fellowship, right? You've been there. You've done that. They're praying. They're serving. They're giving. They're going out. And many more people are being added to their number daily than must have been taking the gospel with them. And, and here's the thing, a, a lot of, there's a lot of belief today among Christianity that what you need, if you're going to extend God's kingdom, you're going to build a great church, you need really, really excellent light shows, you need the best singers, a far better preacher than what we got here, you need wonderful facilities, you need all of this stuff. Can I just tell you, this early church had none of that. They met in Solomon's colonnade. It was hot. They didn't have amplification. They certainly didn't have lighting. And upon the leadership of the apostles, they just devoted themselves to a few practices that they took with them wherever they went. And God used those men and women to change the world. Now, in, in our first week of this series, I, the, I, we talked about the first three things that they did, kind of the fundamentals of discipleship. They devoted themselves daily to the Word and in prayer, right? Just as Jesus said, right? If you're going to come after me, you deny yourselves daily, and you take up your cross, and you follow me. And that's what we do as, as believers in Jesus. If we're going to be disciples of him every day, I'm going to follow Jesus today, right? We open up the Word. We look and see, what does God have for me today? Where is my life not lived in conformity with what I'm reading. We spend time throughout our day in prayer, not depending on our own strength, our own wit, our own skill, but we turn to the Lord over and over and over throughout our days, offering ourselves to Him in prayer, seeking His guidance and His power. So the first fundamental of discipleship is devoting ourselves daily. The second is gathering consistently. Now, this is not a popular thing whatsoever in our culture today, right? I mean, we we have lots of opportunities. We're so affluent. We can go here and do this. We can chase kids and and ball or cheer. And if it's not the kids, we'll find something else to do, right? But these early believers just made it a habit of gathering consistently with one another. They would gather to hear the word preached. They would worship together. They would encourage one another. 
And then they committed themselves to community. It says they met in Solomon's colonnade, and then they met house to house with people who, you know how it is when you share a meal with people. Y'all ever had anyone live with you, like move in for a while? Um, when I was a kid, I had a, a family member who moved in with us, and, and, you know, I knew her before that, but then I knew her, knew her, you know, and she smoked cigarettes, and it really bothered me. I remember being a kid, and I threw away a carton of cigarettes not knowing how much money that costs, right? When you do life closely with people, you get to see not just the good things, right, that you, you know, before knew about on holidays, but you get to see all of their life, and what happens for us as believers who live in community, in these deep, rich, abiding relationships with one another, we don't just see the good, And we don't just see the bad. We get to see the whole of their life. And what we get to do to one another is demonstrate the grace of Jesus Christ where we know each other, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we choose to love one another anyway. We lock arms and say, we are going to pursue Jesus Christ together. So the first three fundamentals of discipleship, devote daily, gather consistently, and commit yourself to community. I want to share a quick story with you. Uh, you. You may know this. If you grew up kind of my day, you might have some of this history. In 1986, the Lakers were said to be the best team ever assembled. They were led by uh, Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, right? They were the team. Uh, the pundits uh, wondered how they could possibly lose, uh, again, uh, most talented team ever assembled. And they were, they were, you know, playing quite well, steamrolling opponents. The expectations were high. They were coached by Pat Riley, a great mind in basketball. And yet, when the playoffs came, the most talented team ever assembled, these extraordinarily talented players, they stumbled in the Western Conference Finals. They didn't even make the NBA championship, and people were shocked. The most talented team ever assembled, a great mind, the coach leading them at the helm. And so Coach Pat Riley decided in the offseason he better do some work. He knew that he had the talent. He knew that they had the potential. Everything was there to have a championship team, and yet they weren't playing like a championship team. And so in the offseason, what Coach Riley didn't do was uh, reconfigure their offense. And he didn't make any major roster changes. You know what he did? He actually went to every single player and presented them with a list of their historical stats and kind of the, the very fundamental parts of basketball. It was literally shooting, passing, rebounding. Those fundamental, and, and he challenged every single player to improve just 1% in those fundamentals of basketball. Now, it may have seemed weird to have the most talented players in the NBA on this team and say, hey, you need to get better at the fundamentals. But that's, that's what he did. And so every um, player, I'm, I'm going to get more rebounds. I'm going to have more steals. I'm going to have more assists. I'm going to shoot more baskets just to, to improve 1% in every statistical category. And if you know the story in 1987, the Lakers ultimately beat the Boston Celtics and won the championship. Why do I tell you that? Because the fundamentals don't seem all that attractive. But even for the most talented roster ever compiled to date, even you know the, the amazing talent that these men had, If they were going to reach their potential, it was going to be reached by looking back to the fundamentals of basketball and improving in those areas. Can I just say this to you and I once again? If we're going to be fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ, which is what we have been called to be, and if we're going to make fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ, we've got to look back to the fundamentals of what it means to be a disciple. We call these the six practices here. You've probably heard us say it over and over. You might get tired of hearing us talk about the six practices. Listen, we say that our mission is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus? Do you know how we do that? We teach them to do these six things. It's not necessarily fancy. It doesn't seem like, I mean, you're probably not ready to go charge hell, you know, with a water pistol when when you hear that. But that... This is how we make disciples. This is what Jesus has called us to do. And so I, I would just call on you to be the church that changes the world. And we're not going to get, like, suddenly, you know, way smarter or, or way more talented than God has made us. But we have the power of his Holy Spirit. And God has given us these disciplines that we might know him and be transformed by him, by one another, through his word and through prayer and walking with him. So the final three fundamentals of discipleship, we call these practices of a disciple day. I want to talk to you about those in just the next few minutes. And it's our, my hope that we could all grow in these. If you're not killing it in every category... Welcome to Cross Community Church. We aren't either. Not everyone here is doing all of these things to perfection. There's no uh, police around that says, you know, if you're not doing this, you get the boot from our church. Uh, but this is what we have just decided as a, as, as a body. This is what we're going to center our lives around, pursuing Jesus and one another. We're going to pursue him 
together. And so I, before I get there, I do want to make a few uh, clarifications. What I'm talking to you about when we talk about these fundamentals, this, these practices of a disciple, I'm not giving you legalistic expectations that if you don't shoulder all of these things, Jesus isn't going to love you. He's not going to save you like he's going to kick you. That's, that's not true at all. We have been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ through faith alone, right? We are his children. Um, but in the same way that I want my kids to grow up, right, I want them to, to grow up and be strengthened. I was so proud of being on the mission trip this week, and they endured difficult conditions, and they served well. And as a dad, I'm just like, yes, you know, I'm like, it's all, my kids wouldn't cease to be my kids if they weren't growing in some areas. But I'm so proud of them when they do. And what I want to see is them to reach their potential. Listen, God has marked out a race for every single one of us to run. God knows the plans that he has for our lives. He's written those before the foundations of our life. God knew those things that he wants us to grow and mature and to ultimately reach our potential. Again, these things are merely opportunities to reach our potential. I've said this before. Every command that you see in Scripture, every one of these teachings and disciplines, these are invitations to the abundant life in Christ Jesus. Now, they might feel difficult on the front end if you're not a great reader, you know, diving into the Word, and it's an ancient document, and this is really difficult. What I would want you to know is these are the very words of God. This is the inspired Scripture, right? It's difficult at first, but as we read and God begins to teach us and grow us, it bears fruit in our life. And so every command that we ever find in Scripture is an invitation to abundance. As, as I call you to these things, uh, it's not a legalistic call, but rather, and it's a call to reach your potential, to know Jesus Christ, to love him more, and to be who God has called you to be. So um, number four, discipline number four, practice number four is that of serving faithfully. So devote yourselves daily, gather consistently, commit to community, and serve faithfully. Uh, Jesus said this in Mark chapter 10, verses 42 and 43. As Jesus called to them and he said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, that lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Y'all know this. It kind of happens this way in our world, right? The person at the top of the food chain, kind of the top of the, the hierarchy, the org chart, that person's the one that gets to call all the shots. And everybody kind of down below has to do exactly what they say or there's going to be uh, consequences, right? It may work that way in your job or your workplace. That's kind of how we know how things work in America. But Jesus, in teaching us about the kingdom, in teaching us how to be disciples of his, he, he says this, he says, but it shall not be so among you. That's not how it works in the kingdom of God. But whoever would be great among you must become your servant. You want to know greatness? You want to know abundance and fullness of life? It doesn't come through having people look up to you and praise you and obey you and serve you. True greatness and abundance in the kingdom of God is found through becoming the greatest servant. I would just point you to Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who took on flesh, and he humbled himself. He just didn't become a servant in an ordinary way, right? He became a bond slave who was obedient unto death. Now, discipleship is about following Jesus. If we're not serving we're not following Jesus, right? I mean, if you want to know what discipleship looks like, it looks like someone serving another person in the power of the Spirit. So in this church, it may not feel like this to you. It may not feel like greatness to serve. It may not feel like greatness to give up your time to offer it to somebody else. As a matter of fact, um, you won't always be treated very well as a servant. I heard a missionary one time say, don't call yourself a servant and then get offended when someone treats you like one, right? Sometimes we get treated that way, and yet Jesus said, hey, you want to you know, know greatness? You want to know fullness of life and abundance in the kingdom of God? It's not found through being the person at the top. It is found in ultimately being a servant. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus says, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. You want to be exalted by God, by the King of kings and the Lord of lords? We humble ourselves, and we become the servant of the people around us. And we don't just do it here in this place. We do it out in the world. We do it in our workplace. We do it in our home. We become the servant of all. Now, this, this doesn't always come easily for me, right? 
This comes, that's one of those things when we uh, come to Jesus every day, we deny ourselves, we take up our cross and follow him. Part of that looks like becoming a servant. Jesus, today, I'm going to serve my family well. Jesus, today, I want to I serve well in my workplace. Would you empower me for that? Remember, all of these things are empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. It won't necessarily come easily to you. Now, I, I want you to know this. You may not have realized this, but members of this body have been serving you all week long. Uh, men and women were here taking out of their time on a holiday weekend. They were mowing uh, the grass, weeding, blowing off the curbs, maintaining this facility. Men and women have been here cleaning bathrooms and toilets and vacuuming and sweeping the floors. There are men and women serving right now in our nursery area, teaching your kids and students. Men and women went on a mission trip this week, uh, caring for uh, people that really, they were in, in need. People at the back right now, uh, running cameras and sound, they're all serving you, offering their gifts. I don't know if you know this, but not a single person uh, on our, our worship team uh, does this full-time. They all work full-time jobs, and they take a tremendous amount of time out of their schedule to practice and to prepare their hearts to lead you. If you're part of this church and you're not offering your gifts to the Lord, I want you to know you are missing out on seeing the power of God at work through you, um, but also we're missing out on your gifts as well. Sometimes churches limp because not all of their members are serving. We're a body with many parts. We need you. So maybe this year, maybe you've been studying well. You're in the Word. You're giving it right. You're here. You're in a community group, but you're not offering yourself in service. Maybe for this year, you just say, hey, God, would you show me where I fit? Man, I don't feel like it. I don't feel good enough. I don't feel worthy, but I want to offer myself in service to you. So Devote daily, gather consistently, commit to community, serve faithfully. And the next one, I know uh, for a few weeks you've probably been anticipating this one. Uh, the fifth practice of a disciple is to give sacrificially. In America, we are the most prosperous society in the history of the world. I was talking to a guy this morning, uh, and you go to some countries, and the poorest person in America looks wealthy by comparison. Uh, we are a generation of people who, 100 years ago, you take the wealthiest people in society, and they didn't have half of what we have. Like, we are extraordinarily blessed. But Jesus gave us a warning about that. In his inaugural Sermon on the Mount, Jesus stood up and began teaching about life in the kingdom. And one of the things he warned us about in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, he, he said this. He said, No one can serve two masters. For he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And that makes really good sense to us. I don't know if you've ever had two people in, in your job that were your bosses, and you're trying to please both of them, and sometimes their, their uh, commands conflict, and, and you can't seem to please anybody. It can be really difficult, right? Just even have two bosses in your job. Um, but Jesus is telling us something even deeper. You can't serve two masters. You'll love one and despise the other. And then he tells us what he's really talking about. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, as he began to teach his disciples about life in his kingdom, he said, you can't serve two masters. And then he identifies the one that will compete with our hearts for our affections and our attention, our devotion and our time, our obedience even. And he says this at the end of 24, he says, you cannot serve God and money. Now, most of us would say in this room, I'm not mastered by money. I like money. I like to spend money. I like to use money as a helpful thing. And most of, us, most of us would say, I'm not mastered by money. And yet, for many of us, um, we have debts for things that we can't afford. And we consume things hoping that they're going to do what only God can do, right? Make us feel full and satisfied. And then we get that thing, and, and it satisfies us for about 10 minutes, and then we want the next thing. And many of us have been living these lives for decades, reaching for the next thing, the next vehicle, the next car, the next house, the next decoration, the next thing. And, and really what money does is it promises what only God can provide. Only God will truly provide for us and make us secure, give us safety and security for all of our lives. Money promises what only God can provide, and Jesus says, be really careful that you don't start trusting in it. Be really careful that it doesn't master your life, that you don't have more confidence and faith and affection for money, ultimately, than you, more than you would God. He warns us. And so what do we do about this? Because we live in the most affluent society in history. Our poor people are wealthier than most of the whole world, even the richest in other parts of the world. 
How do we live lives where we're not mastered by money, where we don't get into these places where we're working more and more and more hours so we can make more money, so we can have more stuff, and only, be, only to be left empty by that? How do we keep from being mastered by money? The way that we do that is we surrender every part of our lives to God. Our hearts, our thoughts, our hands like we serve, right? And even our pocketbooks, we surrender them to God knowing that the source of all of our income, the source of all of our provision is ultimately God. He alone is our provider and we are merely his stewards who use his money in a way that's consistent with him. Throughout the New Testament, we are called to give. You look at those early believers when they came to faith in Jesus. They've been a believer for 25 minutes and they went and they took everything that they had and they shared it in common. They sold possessions that other people who didn't have what they have could be fed. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him wouldn't perish, would have everlasting life. Our God is a giving God. God gave to us his only son. If we're following Jesus, we will be a giving people. And not only that, if we're not going to be mastered by money, we have to surrender it to God and give it as he would see fit. And so um, just a few uh, questions I have for you to know. Uh, maybe you're mastered by money. The reason we call you to give sacrificially is so that your money doesn't get a hold of you, right? You can tell your money what to do instead of your money telling you what to do. And if you find yourself in, in, a, in a difficult situation, we have people here that would love to visit with you, help you walk through financial difficulty so that your money doesn't have control of your life anymore. Uh, but we call on you to give sacrificially because that's what God did for us. A few questions for you. Number one, very simply, are you obedient to God in the way that you spend your money? Do you even consider God in the way that you're spending your money? Um, if not, God may not be your master, right? If he's not the one telling you what to do with it, uh, maybe God isn't your master. Number two, are you content with what God has provided for you, or are you always seeking more? Do you spend time worrying about your money and possessions, or are you trusting God to provide exactly what you need? Maybe a clear question. Whose kingdom are you seeking with your money? Are you seeking God's kingdom? Or are you trying to build yours? One of the reasons that we give sacrificially is in the act of giving money away. Our hearts, ultimately, um, when we sow money into God's kingdom, our hearts follow it there. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, 33, he said, Seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you. He was talking about the Gentiles and how they were always concerned about the food that they were going to eat, you know, what, you know, what the clothes that they were going to, how am I going to look on Sunday, right? God, I need this, I need, or I need this, I need that. The Gentiles who didn't believe in God were always concerned. And he's like, that's the way of unbelievers. The way of the disciple is to seek God's kingdom and to trust him to provide everything you're going to need. Are you seeking God's kingdom with your wealth? One of the reasons that we give sacrificially is that our hearts will be wrapped up in God's kingdom, seeking His first. And so a practical way for you is the first check that you write in any given month needs to be sowing into God's kingdom, giving to the church or caring for your neighbors, right? We sow to God's kingdom first, seeking it first, and trusting that God will provide. So we devote daily, we gather consistently, we commit to community, we serve faithfully, we give sacrificially, and the final one is that we engage missionally. Of all of the things I have told you, um, these practices, which help us to know God and love God and walk with God, give our hearts fully to Him, if the early church had not done this last one, we wouldn't be here today. If we don't engage missionally, if we don't go and share the gospel with people that need to hear it, the church will not be here in a single generation. We engage missionally as the people of Jesus. You think about what Jesus did with his lifestyle. He went from village to village and town to town teaching people about the kingdom of God. That's what he gave his life to. And if you were one of his disciples, you went with him, right? And then he, he sent them out. They were going to heal the sick and care for, for those who were in, in trouble. They fed people when they needed to be fed. Like they lived these lives. And then Peter, 
hey, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And Peter was the guy. He got to stand up and preach on the day of Pentecost. And God did this remarkable thing. And over and over and over, both in these big settings like Peter preaching on Pentecost and in these small settings that we don't even have recorded in in the lines of Scripture, men and women articulated the gospel to people that needed to hear They shared hope with people who were hopeless. They helped those who were helpless. The people of God for centuries have been declaring the gospel that people needed to hear it, and that is what ultimately transforms the world. As the people of God, as His church, we have been called to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything He has commanded. Before baptism is belief right? Before we dunk somebody in water, they come to faith in Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul, who uh, would utter a phrase that we love to hear, it should fill our hearts with hope. Romans chapter 10, uh, he talks about this in a, a great length. And he says this, he says for, and let's just celebrate this, for everyone, right? Get that word in your mind, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Can we just praise Jesus for that? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. Like that frustrating family member, that person that you're tempted to give up on, the person who seems like their life is hopeless, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. Like God is able to save and to transform, and he is willing. The blood of Jesus is sufficient for them. And I hope that upon hearing that, like you're encouraged for people that you might have begun to doubt whether God's ever going to do something, right? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. Your coworker, a frustrating kid at school, your neighbor who makes all the noise, is going to be shooting off fireworks at midnight tonight, right? Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. And then the Apostle Paul calls us to consider something. And it's our role in God's work of salvation. He says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? You don't believe in Jesus. You're not going to trust him, right? You're not going to call on him. And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And the final question, how are they to hear without someone preaching? The Jews in Rome thought that they could crush the church. The Apostle Paul engaged in this, thought they could crush the church. And we're going to persecute believers. We're going to tell them to be quiet, not to speak in the name of Jesus. The early church, they imprisoned them. They thought, if we do this, then the believers will be too afraid to share. All right, they'll just kind of take their faith, go home. And this, this whole movement about Jesus will just kind of die off. But when the persecution broke out in Jerusalem and scattered believers across the known world, they took the gospel with them. And the movement only spread more. And it would be my heart's prayer that if God allowed something like that in our city, that if Cross Community Church couldn't exist anymore because we've all been scattered by some persecution, my heart's desire is that we would be a people who take the gospel of Jesus Christ with us. Do you you remember what Jesus said at the very beginning of Acts, that church that changed the world? He said, But you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to receive power. And you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. And when the Spirit came, they did indeed receive power. And they were witnesses across the world at that time. Why should we think we're any different? The Holy Spirit is still in the business of saving people who are in desperate need of salvation, of giving hope to the hopeless and help to the helpless. Why would we think God would do anything different today? Now, if you're intimidated by sharing the gospel, I don't, I mean, I can't always defend everything about the Bible and I don't have enough knowledge. What Jesus did not tell us is that we would all be experts when the Holy Spirit came on us. Now, we should study the Word and seek to know it. But you know what he he called us? He said, you will be witnesses, right? In Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. You'll be my witnesses. You know what a witness is? You go to a a trial or whatever. A witness is someone who who simply testifies to what they've experienced, right? They testify to what they've seen and what they've heard, to what God has done. Any one of us on any given day with anybody in this world has the opportunity to share what Jesus Christ has done in our lives. We don't have to have like, you know, a degree in apologetics or, you know, a degree in theology. We don't have to be able to argue with the great minds. But what we can simply do is be witnesses to what Jesus Christ has done in our lives. Now, our church... 
uh, we've been working for about three years on these six practices of a disciple, calling on people to devote daily, to gather consistently, to commit to community, to serve faithfully, give sacrificially, and then ultimately to engage missionally. And, and listen, our members here, they're doing it. Like God is doing a thing in our midst. We did an assessment at the beginning of this year, and uh, I just want to share a few quick results with you, and then we'll, we'll close here. Uh, 77% of our members are spending time with God in His Word, devoting themselves daily four or five or, or more times per week. 77%. And so, yes, you can clap. That's awesome. People in the Word of God, right? That is life-changing. If you've never done it, dive into the Scriptures and watch what God will do, right? Um, 93% of our people are spending time with God throughout their day in prayer. So praise God for that, right? 100% of our members here would say they're going to attend here at least twice monthly. Uh, our hope is that that would be uh, even more frequent than that. But 53% of our people are like, I'm there every week. And I'm committed to my church. I'm going to be there. 85% of our members report gathering with their community group almost always. So miss a week here or there, but almost always. 94% report pursuing deep relationships with the people in their community group, like these deep, rich, abiding relationships that are kind of, uh, in, what would we say, immersed in the gospel, right? 96% say that growth and maturity is being experienced in their group, and it's expected by everyone there. 72% of our members are serving their church often or always, using their gifts to build up the body. 47% of our members report giving between 5 and 10% of their income um, to the church or to other causes. Which kind of sounds low until you add in the other part of that number that says 38% report giving more than 10%. So you just stack those numbers together. 85% of our people are giving a significant percentage of their income to seek the kingdom of God. And we can just celebrate that. As a matter of fact, uh, we just heard the Supreme Court decision, Roe v. Wade is overturned. Um, and a, a lot of the accusations we get from, from people that were pro-choice is, well, you only care about babies to be born. You know, you know you're pro-birth, you're not pro-life. But uh, because you give, and we're able to be involved with the care portal here in LaFleur County, where we get to meet needs of kids who are in foster care. We get to provide beds for families who want to take kids in. We get to care for people uh, in, in extraordinary ways, and that happens all the time. Uh, because you give, we get to meet the needs of people in our community, and, and, and we do that a lot. It's, it's even increased now that inflation's happening and people are in need, and, and we get to say yes all the time because you are giving and sowing money into the kingdom of God. We get to have gospel conversations with people that need a tank of gas, you know, and like God is doing a great work through your giving. We got to send people to West Virginia. We're going to spend in excess of $100,000 on mission endeavors throughout this year. That's because you give. Thank you for giving sacrificially. Um, when it comes to engaging missionally, 21% of our people say often or always they are sharing and inviting others to follow Jesus. Praise God, right? That's, that's, that's a fifth of our church, right? That's amazing. And uh, an additional 49% are saying, I don't always kill it. There are days I miss it. But 49% of the people who say, uh, sometimes I'm going out and I'm sharing the gospel. This is a picture of the church that changes the world. It is just faithful men and women who are seeking Jesus and seeking to make him known with their lives. And so I just want to celebrate you today and say, thank you, church, for following after Jesus. I can't wait to see what God's going to do in our community. I believe that God takes men and women, just like us, ordinary people, whose hearts are fully his, who seek after him, devote their lives to him, and he uses us to change the world. And that might be in a really big way that someone writes about in a headline one day, and it might be in a small way. But what a joy it is to be served and used by Jesus, to serve the God who served us first, to seek the God who sought us first, to give to the God who first gave himself to us. What a joy it is. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for your church. We thank you for baptisms, and we got a ton of them coming up. We just praise you for the work that you're doing in saving men and women, in transforming lives in our community. And God, it is just our prayer that you would use us all the more as we seek after you, as you conform us to your image. God, would you just continue to do that work in us and through us? Would you transform our city and our community and use these men and these women? Use me. Lord, you are good. The gospel is the hope of the world. May we be the kind of church that gives our life to you, seeks after you, and is ultimately used by you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.